This podcast comes to you from the University of Toronto, Mississauga. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the university operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to work on this land, and we strive toward peace and reconciliation among all peoples. Hi, I'm Jill Kasky, Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Welcome to Medieval Art Matters, a podcast where we showcase the vitality of contemporary research on the Middle Ages. In each episode, we invite a scholar to talk about a critical issue that has shaped the experiences of people living centuries ago and that still matters today. I'm joined by my co-host, Professor Linda Safran, for a discussion of today's theme, Gender and the Body in Byzantine Art. Hi, I'm Linda Safran of the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies in Toronto. Our guest is Professor Roland Betancourt, Professor of Art History and Chancellor's Fellow at the University of California, Irvine. Professor Betancourt's research focuses on the visual culture of the Byzantine Empire. He's also examined the role of Byzantine art in modern and contemporary art and popular culture. He's the author of three books, Sight, Touch, and Imagination in Byzantium, Byzantine Intersectionality, Sexuality, Gender, and Race in the Middle Ages, and his newest title, Performing the Gospels in Byzantium, Sight, Sound, and Space in the Divine Liturgy. Welcome, Professor Betancourt, and thank you so much for being on our show. It's a pleasure to be here. I would also like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the shared territory of the Tongva and Ahashiman people who have continuously lived on this land and acted as its stewards for the last 8,000 years. The area is also presently home to many other communities of indigenous peoples from across the Pacific Islands and Latin America. And as a historian, I'm committed to this process of decolonization and to continually affirming these lands and their people. We're looking at an image of St. Mary the Egyptian on the podcast page of artofthemiddleages.com. Could you give us a basic sense of the fresco and where it's located? Yes, so this fresco is located in the church um, in Asinu in Cyprus. And what we are seeing here is actually a fresco that is located in the main sanctuary of the church. So what does this painting tell us about Byzantine attitudes toward gender and bodies? I'm particularly fascinated by Byzantine art in general because of its systematics and coherence, particularly when looking at a um, synchronous location and thinking about a particular space that was done by a group of artists working together and understanding that the images don't only exist on their own, but in dialogue with one another. And that's why I'm so drawn to the images in this church, particularly this example of Mary of Egypt, where you have a series of other images nearby that allow us to make interesting comparisons to understand precisely what artists were doing in order to understand aspects of gender and the body, in particular with the depiction of Mary of Egypt. So Mary of Egypt is a fascinating figure who has a very complex backstory. Various different narratives of her life give her either a very pious beginning or a more scandalous beginning. But what really draws me to this image is the details of how artists have very purposely violated a lot of the gender stereotypes of femininity that we often find in Byzantine sources. Um, a sort of paleness of the face, a roundness of the face, hair that is bound, hair that is covered. Um, all these details, the artists are very interestingly subverting here to show a body that in many ways is masculinized and speak to Mary's transcendence to a more holy place. Let me just ask you, though, what's the difference between gender and sex? So that's a great question. And I think um, the more um, standard answer to this is that gender discusses the social, cultural constructions of how we perform a sort of 
gendered binary, a sort of dif distinction between man and women in culture, whereas sex oftentimes describes the biological characteristics of the body defined by sex characteristics and so on. One thing that I do also want to contribute to this conversation, though, is that in a lot of recent work by trans scholars and across trans studies, there's also a sensitivity to understanding that, of course, our definitions of sex are as much culturally constructed as our definitions of gender. And so I think that's one of the very interesting aspects to think about here when we look at these images, because while we might think that these are modern definitions and modern understandings of gender versus sex, there is also a very clear understanding in antiquity in the medieval world of precisely intersex people whose um, really confront these ideas of these divisions of, you know, how do they live out their gendered identity in a binary um, gender society, whereas also there's a conversation about where their sex fits into this. And so these conversations that might seem very modern are still evident um, since antiquity in our text. And so I think it's very important to listen to these conversations and understand that even these definitions of sex are not just objective scientific definitions, but as much products of a culture at a given time. What kinds of Byzantine texts talk about gender? So that's a great question because in many ways they all do in some capacity or another. And so for a lot of my work, the sources that I look at are quite expansive. I might be looking at hagiographic texts that is narratives of a saint's life to understand dynamics of gender, or I might be looking at medical texts that are discussing how the secondary sex characteristics of the body manifest themselves, the differences between different types of women and how their body differs, for example. And of course, you know, a lot of the uh, more moralizing texts, whether it be a saint's life or even commentaries on the Bible, of course, are in dialogue with ideas of gender that are very much in tune with the norms of the period. And so I really like to believe that every source can tell us a little bit about gender, even when they are discussing things that might be radically different. For example, in late antique commentator talking about the senses and comparing, you know, the more sluggish senses as being feminine rather than the more acute ones being masculine. And so I think that that's a really important idea to have an understanding of gender that is not just the sort of dogmatic idea that wants to be projected by one author, but to understand really what is sort of the cultural pulse of how gender is being conceptualized in the period. I was wondering if uh, maybe in this case of Mary of Egypt, how might we take a medical text, for instance, and and uh, compare it to her body? Like, do we see things on her body that are that relate to what some of these texts might be talking about? Yes, that's a really great question. And we can sort of walk through this image a little bit um, to think more about the ways in which this artist is handling Mary in very unique ways. You know, you might find figures in the West, um, like perhaps Mary of Egypt, but more commonly Mary Magdalene, um, as a woman who sort of flees from society, is sort of in a cave, away, here in this case in the desert, and they might appear in some capacity either wearing a hair shirt understood as sort of a practice of asceticism, as a sort of self-disciplining act. And that hair shirt also becomes sort of a hairy body that associates the figure with sort of these wild men, these beasts of the wilderness and ideas of otherness, and that there is a sort of transition between humanity and some form of animal form in this isolation. But you don't really find that imagery in Byzantium. And so looking at this image, I was very struck by that because, of course, I think many of us even who enter um, Byzantine art often are coming to it through Western medieval art. And so looking at this image, I was very struck immediately by the various lines across Mary's body. They're these very short, thin, brown lines that almost seem to be a sort of echo of these images of these hairy bodies that you find associated with the wilderness in the West. And that was immediately surprising to me as a Byzantinist. And I began to then notice a lot of the details. One of the, the fascinating things about Mary's face as well is that in accentuating her wrinkles, you actually have this very angular jaw that droops down, that becomes very harsh, and that which very much goes against these sort of ideas of 
feminine faces being round that a lot of texts prize um, and also praise, especially when you have a figure that is being praised as sort of an exemplar that you know, men and women can look up to, but particularly women can look up to. Why wouldn't she in some way be legible as something that is prized in society? And so then the closer that I looked, I was also very drawn um, to, for example, on her chest, there is this oval shape that almost looks like an eye. And it immediately reminded me of descriptions of withered breasts that are associated with ascetic saints, in particular saints who are assigned female at birth but live out their lives as men in either male monastic communities passing as eunuchs or that isolate themselves also, particularly in the stories of isolation, which Mary would be a really good model for. And so with all of this, I was very struck by these lines that perhaps are a sign of that harsh asceticism, the wearing of the elements out in the desert, um, scarring the body. But I was also very struck by the fact that the lines are not on the hands, which you would imagine to be the most roughened parts. They're on the back. There is this sense here that Mary has almost grown body hair in a very subtle way that still keeps her human. And that's very important here. There's not this sort of mystical transformation. There is a very sort of intentional masculinization of the body here that I was very drawn to, and particularly thinking about these saints' lives where you do have figures who, though are assigned women at birth, live out their lives as men and very much identify in many cases as, you know, please do not prepare my body at burial because I do not want to be revealed um, as a woman to my brothers these very sort of touching pleas as well in these stories. And thinking about that in dialogue with images like these, it really changed the way in which I looked at, a, at this figure. And it also helped me also think about other aspects that come up in these texts. For example, that the darkening of skin oftentimes associated with these transformations that occur in the desert through asceticism, especially this transitioning between um, female and male in the bodies of these ascetic saints. And so these were all the details that for me became very pressing here, particularly when comparing it to other images of women that are adjacent to it in the sanctuary. Indeed, I was just looking at the image next to it with the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, with her round shapes and, and the kind of gentle modulation of her facial coloring, no drooping to speak of. I also, I, I thought it was interesting that in, in terms of the figure of standing next to Mary, who is John the Baptist, he's, he's wearing his typical brown um, tunic and his hairy legs peek out at the bottom. And there's a real difference between how his hair on his hairy legs, how his hair is rendered versus how hers is. It's another mode of differentiation, I guess, between these, these two genders. Yes, and there's a great comparison here because, you know, you do have the same sort of shaggy hair. In some ways, John the Baptist has far more of a sort of subdued curls. Um, and I love in particular here the ways in which the tatters of his garment fade into the body hair, which I love how metaphorically it captures that suffering of asceticism transmuted into these secondary sex characteristics of body hair, which I think so beautifully can be then like retranscribed onto the conversation we're having about Mary of Egypt, that it is hair that is suffering, it is hair that is asceticism, and how deeply entwined these ideas are. Could you explain uh, the concept of a third gender and tell us whether you believe there was such a thing in, in Byzantium? Yeah, that's a really great conversation. And one of the the key aspects of these stories that I've been mentioning of these, um, as I call them, trans monks, you have these narratives where these figures who were assigned female at birth and live their lives as men in the monastery, in every case, live out their lives on being understood as eunuchs because they lack a beard. And this was very interesting because eunuchs in Byzantium really operated as this space for 
sort of gender to break down, to produce room for maneuvering, and that were both a difficult part of ideas of spirituality. So eunuchs were figures who were male, who were castrated through various procedures, and they really, while they were still oftentimes usually referred to with masculine pronouns, they were still operating in this realm where they sort of could be described as men, but also accused of all the stereotypes, all the negative stereotypes that women were accused of. So they they were not a sort of distinct third gender, but they operated in this in-between where, depending on whether they were in favor or not, they could be sort of ascribed to the most positive or negative characteristics of both the sort of gender norms. And so that is a very interesting part of this because I think it also explains why there is such wonderful flexibility and fluidity in the gender that we see in Byzantium. There's a greater comfort with gender variance when you understand that there are figures whose bodies are radically transformed. I think there's there's in Byzantine sources repeatedly sometimes a hesitation, sometimes an, just a simple awareness that our gendered body is very malleable, that it is something that can be changed very radically um, with some very simple bodily changes. And I think that's something that Byzantine authors were intimately aware of. Where do you see Byzantine art history going and, and where would you like it to go? That's a that's a wonderful question because it really makes us look forward to the future. I think there's a lot of interesting work that needs to be done in Byzantium to really comprehend the intersections of race and gender, for example, intersections between sexuality and gender as well, which cannot be isolated. And I think there's a lot of work to be done to take many sources seriously for the evidence they offer up, sometimes in passing, about these complex conversations about gender, sexuality, and race. As someone who just wrote a book on this topic, you know, I came into the subject with almost hesitation, like, am I going to find all the sources that I want to find? And I was rapidly overwhelmed, which is no credit to my research skills, but it is a credit to the amazing archive we have. And, you know, the types of questions that I get in teaching about how, what are the pronouns being used in Greek? What are the pronouns being used in Syriac? This is work that needs to happen in libraries across the world where we cannot trust our critical editions, where we need to look at the manuscripts, see when pronouns change, see how figures are described. So there's so much of a rich amount of work that can be done that it doesn't have to go forward with hesitation or fear of not having a project at the end of five years of research, but rather that has a lot of intimidating amounts of work to be done, spanning all the various languages that Byzantium and its various orbits had at their disposition to write and translate in. So fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Betancourt. Thank you. It's, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you today. It was um, this. This was a real stimulation for me to to dip again into your books and to look forward to the next one. Thank you. I really appreciate it. That was Professor Roland Betancourt on gender and the body in Byzantine art. You've been listening to an episode of Medieval Art Matters, hosted by Linda Safran and me, Jill Kasky. Medieval Art Matters complements the book written by Jill Kasky. Adam Cohen and Linda Safran called Art and Architecture of the Middle Ages, Exploring a Connected World. It is published by Cornell University Press. For more information, go to the website that accompanies the book, artofthemiddleages.com, where you'll also find more podcasts in this series. Medieval Art Matters is made possible by the support of the Department of Art History at the University of Toronto, St. George Campus, and the Office of the Vice Principal and Dean, University of Toronto, Mississauga. Many thanks to the Toronto Consort for providing our music. This podcast was brought to you by Cited Media Productions. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to a Cited Media production. C-I-D-E-D. Find out more at sidedmedia.ca.